by way of announcement. Uh, this Wednesday night, our Bible study continues at this regular time, 8 p.m. We're looking at the book of Revelation. Everybody is, is welcome for that. And um, Friday, um, the bowling club continues to meet uh, in the hall at 7 p.m. Uh, the ladies of the AMWI, they're going on an outing to Khalid. Um, I think this Friday, coming Friday, um, uh, speak to, to Linda after the service to arrange uh, transport. It will be a, a wonderful outing um, for all. Uh, next Sunday, our, our worship here will be led by the, the Reverend Bobby Looney and will be a, a communion service. Uh, and also this morning, we have a, a cup of tea and coffee after the service and, and, and please stay for that and, and enjoy uh, fellowship together. Let's let stand and, and, and sing as we worship God together. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. <laughs>
I marvelous, I wonderful. The saying of our Savior, <coughs> love for each of us, personally and intimately for, for every one of us. That while we had our backs turned against you, going our own way, wanting to plot our own path, wanting nothing to do with you. You came into your world to accomplish salvation for each and every one of us. To give your <coughs> life for our life uh, as our ones. So that through, through faith in you, our risen living Saviour, we might be counted righteous. We might be received by the Father as his beloved and accepted children forevermore. He who did not spare us and son but give him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Lord, we just praise you and we stand in awe that as we are bowed before you now, there's no <coughs> limit to what you will give us. To what you will do in and through our lives for your glory and honour, which are ultimate delight and treasure of us. All our hope today is in you who gave his son for us. And there's nothing more important, more precious in our lives than, than knowing you, than, 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 than walking with you, than, than growing in our relationship as mm -hmm. your children. Bowed in your holy presence this morning. We acknowledge that at many times, in many ways, over these past days, we have fallen short of your glory. We have missed the mark. We thank you for the assurance that though we stumble and fall, your love for us does not decrease. You do not reach the point where, where you are ready to be. Give up on us. We thank you that your, your love for us is eternal and unconditional. And in that love that we are forgiven, we are cleansed and renewed. Because your blood blots out all our sins. Mm -hmm. And in the assurance of your unfailing love, cleansed and freed from all that defiles and binds us, we go forward to to shine for you, to stand for you in this world, knowing that it's not us, but you in your grace and power living through us. Lord, as we worship you this morning, we ask that through your Holy Spirit, you will meet with us afresh, that you will do a work of grace and, and renewal in our hearts, that, that, that through our worship, we will become closer to you, and more like you. That through our worship, your name will be exalted and lifted up above all things. To you be all glory, praise, honour, and adoration, for you alone are worthy. And now we join our prayers together in the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We now receive our offering for God's word.
these gifts your children have brought in worship, praise, honour, adoration to you. We ask that you take and use them for the sharing of your love and good news in this, your world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Humanly speaking, there is no reason to have peace. You meet us with eternal, overflowing, abundant comfort in the depths of our sorrow. Thank you, where humanly speaking, there appears to be no way that you make a way for us. That you are sovereign and working in all that we face for our ultimate good and delight and joy. In you. Lord, as we bow before you, we, we recognize that we are we are heard, we are received. Not because of any goodness in us or anything we've 
we, we've done to, to deserve you to hear and answer us, but because of what you, your Lord and Saviour, did for us. Our salvation, our righteousness, our, our hope is in you. That you sit at the Father's right hand side, interceding for us. Lord, we bring before you those in our fellowship who are sick and unwell. Unable to be here this morning because of ill health, struggling with various issues. We, we pray for your healing hand to stand on all the community. That you would take away all, all anxiety and worry that, that people have over their conditions, over mm -hmm. death results, <coughs> that they're away. That each one might be assured that, that they are in your hands and safe in your care. For those who mourn, continue to meet them with your eternal Lord, we thank you for your church here in this place, for the faithfulness of your servants to share your love and good news with this community, to build each other up in, in fellowship. We thank you for, for all that is done on, on Sunday morning in various capacities and, 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 and throughout the, the, the week in all that we're involved in. Lord, we we pray that you would give strength to us all to continue your work. That as we seek you for new things, you would have us develop and do you. That we would know your wisdom. That you would fill us with excitement and zeal about what you can accomplish through us. And that we would step out in faith in the ways that you are calling us to do so. As we seek you, may we find the path you have for us and may we receive the grace and the strength step out on it, that your, your work in this place may continue to, to flourish and grow and bring glory and, and honour to your name. We think of the, the Methodist Church in Ireland as we, we move uh, toward conference. We, we pray for, for wisdom and, and grace for our leadership, <coughs> that, that you would uh, encourage them in, in, in what they do. That as they seek to be faithful and obedient to you, Lord, you would show them your path and they would lead your church forward in it. Lord, we think of situations around the world where there is uh, conflict. We just continue to pray over all that is happening in Israel and, and Gaza. We pray for a just fair, lasting settlement and peace for everyone in that region. The unimaginable suffering would come to an end, but the leaders would work toward that, both in the region and throughout the world. We pray that the conflict would not further escalate, but Lord, that would quickly de-escalate. We think of, of Christian uh, believers both in Gaza and in Israel. We thank you for their faithful witness in, in incredibly trying times, responding to evil with good and being a, a, a light for you. Continue to encourage them on the path that they are on. And through the power of your gospel witness from their lives, may, <coughs> may the hearts of those around them be changed. We think of all that's happening in in Ukraine, when the, the apparent stalemate that there, there is there and, and the continual uh, suffering and loss of life without uh, any gains, so to speak, on, on either side. Lord, we, we pray for justice and, and freedom for the people of Ukraine. Uh, that, that this fighting uh, would come to an end, that, that, that the, the young generation would be able to get on with their their future, that, that no more would be lost on the battlefield. We ask that you would change the heart of, of President uh, Putin, and that he would uh, take his, his troops, Lord, out of that land. And we pray for <coughs> the leaders throughout the world to, to work uh, together to, to bring about uh, peace and, and justice 
in that region. And Lord, there's countless other places in the world uh, where there is, is conflict in, in Africa and, and South America, both, both between countries and, and internally in countries. Lord, we thank you that, that even when things appear to be spiraling under control, that, that you, are, you are sovereign, that you have a, a purpose. We pray for, <coughs> for peace throughout the nations. We pray that you would sustain your church in places where it is persecuted. And, and, and through, through the, your church's witness in, in, in those circumstances, people will come to know you. Lives will be changed. Nations will be turned around. We thank you that you are the God of the impossible. And that through us laying down our lives in, in weakness for one another in the world, that you advance your kingdom. And, and the forces of the, the evil one cannot prevail against them. Not by might or by power, but by your spirit. By your spirit. Enable us, Lord, and empower us, equip us to move forward on the path of obedience that you have for us. That through us, the world might see you and be transformed by you. Lord, all that is on our hearts, we lay before you, knowing that you can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask for, seek, or imagine. To you be all glory, power, and honor. In Jesus' name. Amen. We turn now to God's Word. This morning we are reading from 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. <clears throat> Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands, and his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. We thank God for his word to us and trust he will add his blessing to us. We're going to sing now our third hymn. <coughs> there is a higher throne that all this world has known. Where faithful ones from every time will one day come.
Let's pray before we live together at God's Church. Lord, we thank you for your word that it is living, it is true, it is powerful. We pray by your spirit you will take your precious truths and penetrate and transform our hearts with them. In Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Some time ago, I watched a very harrowing and moving film which was based on a true story. It was called Blood Diamond. The film was made to highlight the cruelty of the illegal diamond trade in Sierra Leone, which is run by cold-blooded and ruthless militias. A man by the name of Solomon Bandy was captured along with his son Dia by a militia. His wife and daughter managed to avoid capture and find their way to the safety of a refugee camp. Solomon was forced to work in a diamond mine, while Maldia was brainwashed into becoming a child soldier. After escaping from the mine, Solomon set out on a quest to find and <coughs> save his son. Toward the end of the movie, there's a, a scene in which Dia stumbles upon Solomon at, at a checkpoint and, and points a gun at him. As his son stares at him with eyes that are devoid of any warmth and humanity, Solomon grabs him by both shoulders and says the following words to him. Dear Bandy, what are you doing? You're a good boy who loves soccer and school. Your mother loves you so much. She waits for you with your sister, making your favorite food every day. I know they made you do bad things, but you're not a bad boy. I am your father who loves you. And you will come home with me and be my son again. Dia's ice cold facade melted and they embraced. If his identity as Solomon's son enabled him to overcome his hate and the wickedness he was brainwashed with, how much more will our identity as children of God enable us to overcome everything that holds us down and leads us astray in our Christian walk. The message of this passage is we need nothing else apart from our faith in Jesus Christ that makes us a child of God. To be victorious over the evil we are confronted with and tempted by in this world. As we look at these verses, we see that God-given responsibility we have to each other as fellow believers in Jesus Christ. And what we must do to, to live by the faith that enables us to fulfill this responsibility as opposed to being crushed by it. So what's the God-given responsibility we have toward each other as believers in Jesus Christ? Our God-given responsibility is to love one another. Verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. Our faith in Jesus that makes us children of God also binds us together as part of his family. Everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. The unavoidable implication of believing in Jesus is that the well-being and advancement of your spiritual siblings is more important, pressing and urgent to you than your own well-being and advancement. This world teaches us to, to value people on the basis of their accomplishments, their positions, their, their qualification. If a person proves to be beneficial to us, if they meet our expectations, if they can do something for us, if they fulfill the role we hope they could fulfill, then we give them admiration and attention. God teaches us to value one another on the basis of the price that was paid to redeem each of us. Everyone you meet is a fully beloved and accepted child of the Father, or a person who has the potential to become one through putting their trust in the Saviour who died to save them. Thus, everyone you meet is worthy in God's eyes of every last drop of kindness, consideration, and compassion.
compassion and understanding you have to give. It's not for us to be disappointed in or to rank one another. As if our commitment to God is down to some superior quality we have within ourselves that they don't have. In Romans 14, the Apostle Paul went like this. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It's before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Perhaps there's a fellow believer with whom you have a strained or a broken relationship. There's an issue between you that you both see entirely differently. A wrong you perceive they have done to you that, that they don't perceive that they won't admit to. Your responsibility and privilege as their spiritual sibling is not to, to run them down or, or to make them into a scapegoat to protect your own image, but rather to, to be there for them unconditionally without judgment and, and condemnation, to help and support them in any way that, that, that they will allow you to do so. To commit them in prayer to the God whose mercy and grace will cleanse, free and transform them. When you know that it's only by Christ's saving grace you stand and will be upheld, you see the world through it. No matter how much someone has hurt you, no matter what bad choices they've made, <coughs> they're no different than you. There are people created in the image of God whom he gave his son for to bring them into a relationship with him. Seeing others through the lens of the grace that saves us means we cannot help but reach out to them with love. In verse 2, John describes to us the nature of love. This is how we know we love the children of God. By loving God and carrying out his commands. God didn't leave it to us to define what love is. An act isn't a loving act, simply because it makes me and, and the person I do it for feel good. I love my two boys. Eating junk food and playing video games all day makes them happy. Them being happy makes me happy, so the loving thing to do is to let them eat junk food and play video games all day. I love my friend. Alcohol numbs his pain, which I can't bear to see him in. And it gets him through the day. So the loving thing to do is to not, not challenge him, just to, to pat him on the back and affirm him on the, on the path that he's on. That type of love is self-serving love. <coughs> it causes rot and decay in our own lives and in the lives of those we lavish it on. True love for one another is defined not by us, but by God. <clears throat> God being love means everything commands mankind is out of love, thus we love people by obeying God's commands. We love people by being honest with them and telling them the truth about right and wrong and the way of salvation as God commands. We love people by wanting their success more than our own and not coveting what they have as God commands. We love people by saying no to lust and adultery and yes to faithfulness as God commands. We love people by going two miles with them when they ask us to go one. By giving them our tunic also when they ask for our cloak. By, by praying for them when they persecute us and forgiving them when they wrong us as many as 77 times in one day as Jesus commands. The God-given responsibility we have toward each other as believers in Jesus is to love each other. What must we do to live by the, the faith that enables us to fulfill this responsibility as opposed to being crushed by it? 
we must remember who we are. And renounce every thought, action, attitude and desire that does not come from our relationship with God as his eternally beloved and accepted child. In verses 3 and 4, John says this. In fact, this is love for God to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. We love God and others by obeying his commands from the heart. To your sinful nature we are born with, this is an exaction we cannot pay, a crushing weight we cannot carry. To understand how faith in Jesus Christ turns obeying God from being a struggle that drains us into a, a, a joyous pursuit that replenishes and, and nourishes our soul. We, we need to understand uh, first well, what, what, what made God's commands burdensome to us to, to begin with. The answer is the lies of the world we were deceived by. It's a burden to be faithful to your spouse. If you believe there's more satisfaction, more gratification in, in, in lust and unfaithfulness than in delighting in her alone. It's a burden to be generous. If you believe happiness is found through, through laying up treasure on earth as opposed to laying up treasure in heaven. It's a burden to say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. <laughs> if you believe the glory that comes from appearing right before men is more precious, more valuable than the glory that comes from being right with God. Faith in Jesus Christ removes that burden. Because by it we have a, a, a new identity that cannot be erased or, or swallowed up. By any loss we suffer, mistake we make, or storm that assails us in this world. We are pure, blameless children of the Father whose purpose and delight is to do His will. We are pure, blameless children of the Father, who have, have nothing to fear, no reason to give into despair. Because our Saviour sits at the Father's right hand side, praying and concerning us re re regarding every issue of our lives, saying to the Father about us, He will be upheld, for I will hold him. My blood which I shed for him, it, it, it speaks for him. By my blood, he she is pure, blameless, righteous. She is eternally yours. <coughs> when you find it tough to be patient, when giving of yourself to serve others starts to feel wearisome, when obedience becomes a joyless, life-sucking duty, say, that's not who I am. Renounce your every attitude, desire, thought, and action that does not come from your relationship with God as his child through your faith in his son, Jesus. Cry out as the great missionary Jim Elliot cried out. O oh God, save me from a life of barrenness, following a, a formal pattern of ethics, of do's and, and don'ts, Give instead that vital contact of soul with your divine life, that fruit may be produced and life, abundant living, may be known. That's how we live by the faith that turns obedience to God from being a struggle that drains us into a joyous pursuit that replenishes us. The faith that is your victory over the deceit and enticement of this world. On one occasion when Joshua, my eldest son, was little, we were living just outside of Boston in the EES at the time, I was looking after him at a large indoor play area at a shopping mall. It had a, a reasonable sized football pitch and lots of foam building blocks. Joshua made a fort for himself out of the building blocks 
and he hid inside it. And we were playing a game which I was standing 20, 20 meters away and kicking softballs toward him, trying to get them through the little hole in the, the roof of his fort that he lay in. With a couple I hit the target and that the rest, they were there or thereabouts. I didn't think what I was doing was that much remarkable. But I noticed one of the attendants watching me as if I were violin Lionel Messi. <laughs> she grabbed another attendant who was walking by, and from the corner of her, my eye, I saw her pointing at me and mouthing the words to him, look at him, look at him. A smirk came over my face. I straightened my back, picked my chest out. This was my moment. All those times I was picked last in the playground, this was going to be white <coughs> away. I was about to prove myself and become a star. With pressure and a sense of occasion reaching fever pitch, I ran up, swiped at the ball, and completely sliced it. I looked over at my adoring fans, pleading with my eyes for them to, to give me one more chance. Again, I took my lip reading skills to good use. The words she mouthed this time were, forget. <laughs> They shrugged their shoulders and walked off as if I never existed. When I was kicking the ball to prove myself and earn acceptance and recognition, it was a crushing, joyless burden I couldn't carry. When I was simply spending time with my little son, his opinion about me wouldn't change no matter where the ball landed. It was a delight. And I excelled. We love because he first loved us with the love of Calvary. And the intensity of that love toward us doesn't change no matter where the ball lands. Let go of everything you lean on and, and live for in this world. To depend completely on the saving love that, that wipes away your stains and picks you up when you fall down. Obeying his commands of come from that love will no longer be a, a burden that crushes and drains you. Rather, it will be a, 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 a delightful pursuit that, that replenishes you and fills you with joy. Perhaps the zeal for the, the Lord that he once had has long since waned. At some point, he started to prioritize other things over him. Instead of asking, what more can I do for my Savior? He's, he's done everything for me. It's, it's, it's wonderful to be in his service. You know, I ask, what's the least I can get away with today? You've wandered so far from the path of sincere obedience and devotion that, that in your own mind, there's no way back. Through the trials and upheavals, He's allowed to come upon you. But you stripped away the things you find your identity worth and security and God has you by both shoulders. He's shaking you and trying to get your attention, just, just like Solomon was with the son of Dia. That thing, that thing you were so focused on and distracted by, it isn't the most important thing. It isn't what your life is about. I'm the most important thing. I'm what your life is about. The relationship you have with me as my child is the only thing that truly matters because it's, it's the only thing that lasts forever. It cannot and will not be taken from you. I know you've made mistakes. I know you've messed up, but there are things you have regrets about. But you're not a bad child. Through your trust in my son Jesus, you're eternally clean, pure, accepted, beloved, delighted in, and cherished. I am your father who loves you. You will come home with me and be my child again. You will come home with me and be my child again and live solely in and from that relationship you have with me. Wherever you are now in your walk with Jesus Christ, whether that be the top of the mountain or the bottom of the valley, 
Remember who you are. Renounce the bitterness, resentment, selfishness, anger, the reluctance, the fear that does not come from your relationship with God as his eternally beloved and accepted child, that does not come from knowing that you are loved with a love that can never let you go, that can never change in its intensity toward you. By so doing, you will live by the fear. That is your victory over the enticements and the deceits of this world. You will pour out love, compassion, consideration, kindness and understanding on everyone you meet and have dealings with in a way that others simply can't. The path of obedience will be for you. A path on which you are replenished and filled his joy. In fact, this is love for God to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our fear. We thank God for his word to us. Amen. Sing now our closing hymn, Give Me the Fear.
turns the mountain before us into a plain. We thank you for that faith by which we are eternally beloved, accepted, cherished, delighted in children of the Father. Held in a love that will never let us go. Held in a love that is greater than anything we face in this world. This morning we cast ourselves afresh on your love. We remember afresh who we are. We go forth as your children to live in and from our relationship with you. And in doing so to radiate your love, your truth and your good news to this world. Or in every step may we find your faithfulness, your grace to be sufficient for us. And may we radiate you to everyone we meet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.